First of all, this is going to be a difficult act after the first two, this wonderful introduction, this really nice talk by Manuel. I guess you can hear me well, that's loud. So, uh, what I want to do today is tell you about, well, obviously being a scientist, I want to tell you about what we work on. That is the most beautiful things in the world. And unfortunately, I had to fit it into this thing called emergent interaction. And it took me a while to figure out why is it that they invited me. And then I realized actually it makes some sense. Because, uh, well, if these emergent properties are complex, you know, patterns that arise out of simple interactions. Uh, well, it turns out that um, what I've been interested in for a long, long time is about protein interactions. So for those of you that, so this is a representation of a protein, it doesn't matter. So for those of you that are not in the life sciences, remember, so we're built out of cells. Cells are these little entities that are full of little machines doing stuff inside. These machines are built out of proteins. And I'm very interested in understanding the principles by which nature has built these machines. And these machines, they, they make operations similar to our fridges, computers, and all that. And they build under, under certain principles that we don't really understand and like to understand out of these entities called proteins. OK. So what we are interested in understanding, how did machines come to be the way they are, these molecular machines? Um, and, and then we try to, to, to use these evolutionary principles. Oops. To, to understand cancer and infectious diseases. Now, what I, I'd like to do today, since this is a, a talk, of, um, since this is a, an evening about emergence, is talking, telling you about how we study emergent properties and the origin of emergent properties. But in, before I start telling you about the really interesting things, I need to go to, I, I will give you some simpler examples to, for you to understand what is the logic that we, that we use to understand the principles by which proteins come to interact. And I, I'm going to use examples from the social interactions. You, you all understand that a person has intrinsic properties, and they are different from the properties that manifest themselves by, the so, by social interactions. And the way that we study this is by using social networks. Well, social networks, before you learn about this, so Facebook is somewhere around here. Took me a while. Oh, there, over there. So I just Googled it today, finding you no know, cartoons for you know, social networks, and there's all these things I never heard about. I don't know what they are, uh, so I know what Facebook is. But anyway, before social networks be became equated with all these, uh, social networks was basically a term used by a, a, an area of sociology where uh, graph theory, network theory, was used to understand how interactions between people arise and evolve over time. And so this is very much what I do at the molecular level. But let's think a little bit how do we actually use to study, use it to study people and how people interact. Well, let's consider, I love this picture. A lot of people, you know, all the people I, gave, I taught before have, uh, know this picture. So I took this from a random Google search. And this represents a group of American teenagers getting ready for the prom night. Now, you know what happens in the prom night. At least, what all, of, at least all the guys are hoping to have sex. And <laughs> And what we would really like to know, does this work, no. is how did they end up choosing their date? I mean, this is an important question, particularly if you're a teenage boy. If you know this, the, the solution to this problem, you, are, you have an advantage. <laughs> anyway, so the way that sociologists do this, they go to the school. They spend almost two years there asking questions to the teenagers. This is a, a school. This is actually a scientific study. I'm making a bit fun, fun of it, but you'll see that you learn interesting things. So they went to a, to a school called Jefferson High, and they interviewed privately all the students and asked them about their sexual partners. Who did you have sex with? There, there's, all sorts of, there's all sorts of questions. Was it important for you and all that? But the, the, <laughs> you assume it was, obviously. But, um, but anyway, then they represent. This is a representation of some of the data. It's a network representation. So a network here is just a, a way of representing things, which are th these circles here that represent people. You can imagine that the pink circles represent women um, and blue circles represent boys. And every time there is a, a line connecting them, it means that this person and that person reported having in sexual intercourse <laughs> with each other. OK. so. You say, you ask, we want to know about the sexual behavior, your sexual behavior in the past two years. So the cumulative, if, the cumulative all the sum of your inter sexual uh, interactions. And so this isn't happening one single night. This wasn't a huge orgy. <laughs> it's very important. And, and they obtain something that looks like this. And the point is, what did you learn from doing this? 
And I don't know about you, when I first looked at this, when I first started getting interested in networks and network theory, eventually I was reading these very serious books, and, so, and eventually I was I referred to this study, and I started reading, and when I first reached that part, I said, oh, you must be joking, you, know, you learn nothing from this. But then it turns out that you do, because when you look at these, the, this arrangement uh, of people in this network, it's not random, so it follows a certain logic, a certain order. And the one thing that they've noticed is that I mean, they notice many things here, but one of the things that they've noticed is that they never found this structure. <laughs> now, but let's understand what this, well, actually they found it once, I won't mention that. So, considering that, um, w if you think about what, what does it mean not finding this structure? And remember that the question that we asked before was, how did we end up choose, how do we choose our sexual partners? And, and I know how we choose mine. Um, you know, they're pretty, they're attractive, they're whatever. There's rules that, that are properties that are intrinsic to the people. Now, how is it that these rules all add up to generate an avoidance of structures or the appearance of certain structures in these networks? Well, let's do a simple computer simulation here. <laughs> so, this is, a real, this is the, the nodes in the network, and now this is a realistic representation of girls and boys. And let's say that this girl fell in love with that boy, and that boy fell in love with that girl, and they were, you know, they held hands and looked lovingly into each other's eyes and so on, for a while, and then, you know, things went wrong. <laughs> they fell out of love. Well, but then, how do, could you end up having a pattern that now closing that, those two lines? Well, it's very simple. They just have to swap partners. And this is the structure emerging, but when you swap partners, um, so you form that structure, and what we see is that, anyway, this structure never appears in the networks, which means that when you choose your sexual partners, you are looking not only at what they look like, you're also considering certain properties of the, the interactions themselves that you're not aware of. And these are these emergent properties, these properties of the interactions rather than the individual you know, beauty and attractiveness of your sexual partner or availability, whatever came first. Anyway, one of the questions that I really, really, that motivates me in science is understanding why is it that my friends are friends of each other? And I don't know if it happens to you, but you know, if, even if you just make a Google search uh, looking for friends, this is what emerges, this group of people together. We tend to think of friends as sort of these social cohesive groups. And so I'd like to know, you know, how do we choose our friends? How do they choose their friends? And is there any rule to choose our friends? Well, and this is where network theory is going to help us because now we can represent social networks and, social, and friendship as um, a link between people. Um, and now this is a person and that person is a friend of that person. Now let's imagine this is me. I can now ask, uh, and these are all my friends, and you can see that they're all friends of each other. So this is what I'm showing you here is a representation of what we call a modular network. Because it has these things, we call them modules. I mean, we call them many things, but modules is one of them. So the question that I ask you, how is it that my friends, why is it that my friends are friends of each other, is now the same question as asking, um, how do social networks become modular? So now I just rephrase my senses in, in, in a manner that I can now address it in a more you know, pragmatic way. But now, uh, I know you'd like me to keep talking about the sex life of adolescents. It even becomes more interesting when we become adults. So for example, those social rules disappear. We know adults have no problems in swapping partners, <laughs> whatever that means. But now let's focus again on how the proteins come to interact. Now, I cannot, I cannot avoid uh, doing this because it's just I like this thing so much, um, telling a little bit of what we do. So I told you about proteins, these very small entities. So, a cell is, is about the thousands of a millimeter. Uh, proteins and protein machines are a thousand to a million of a thousand of a millimeter. So they're really, really small. And they're these little blobs that look, when we know what they look like, we have methods, microscopic methods to study the structure, we end up having things that look like this. Anyway, so this we call is a protein structure. But this representation to me is not very useful because I cannot apply all these wonderful mathematical tools I have with graph and network theory. Well, but what we've done, and this was during, I was still a postdoc when I did, was, was work with a brilliant student who actually very artistically gifted. He was the one who did this image. And we came up with a method of representing these blobs by networks, mini networks. The publicity of what 
the method is there, it's called 3D complex method. But the point is that it, this allowed us to ask a question which is, how do proteins end up, how do proteins within groups of friends, so these are several proteins interacting together, came to interact. Now we, we learned a very special rule, which it's, I've never tried to explain it in simple terms, so let's see how this goes. Don't throw anything at me, please. The point is, so I have this system of people, a system of proteins, I'm sorry, and I want to know, when new things come in, uh, what are the properties of these things that make them sort of very connected to each other? So these modular networks. We've done a lot of analysis that I won't show you, but we ended up, so this is a, just a nod towards the scientists in the room, that when these new nodes come in, the one thing that will make this network click, making these, these you know, closed, closed uh, structures, is if these nodes are very similar to what already is there. So in, because the way you make new genes is many times just copying the ones that you have and changing them a little bit, so we call this duplication, so this, by duplicating what you already have, so making similar things, you can, you can make these modular structures. So this was, for protein biochemists and people interested in evolution of networks, a very, very big news. This failed to excite you, at least not to the level of the sexual networks in teenagers. Um, the, but it told us one thing, that proteins form modules by interacting with similar proteins. Now, the one thing that's, that I don't know if it was obvious to you while I was speaking is that we're using the same type of methods to represent and analyze. It doesn't matter if it's groups of people, if it's groups of molecules, if it's groups whatsoever, of whatever, because this is just a generic approach, and these properties of interactions are very different from the properties of the entities, but they are common across multiple levels of organization. And so, which means that maybe you can learn about social interactions by looking at molecular interactions. So for example, can we then infer that people tend to be friends with people that are similar to them? So I, I leave you with this suggestion. I won't make any further comments about it. And you try to infer if this would be a very interesting project to do in sociology. So I'll stop here. And please take, bear in mind that the take home message of everything that I said is that this, Network analysis reveals complex patterns that emerge from simple local interactions in any type of system. So thank you very much. Thanks.